Look at you, you're on time, all of you. Come on, somebody, except Jesper. Jesper is still not here, oh, sorry. But walks in the father, runs in the family. Ah, oh, very good. Encouragement is a good leadership tool. When you see people doing what you want them to do, encourage them. When you catch people doing what you don't want them to do, confront them. Never be just quiet and hope things will change, okay? Never ever be just quiet and hope things will change. People, people or things don't just change to the better. If you want change, be the change. That's leadership. Now we're going to shift gears. We're going to speak about, uh, Jesper has asked me to speak about the missional church. To be a church that is living on mission, for the mission. And instead of waiting for the people to come to the church, we have to be a church that come to the people. Let me give you uh, an introduction story about uh, my ministry. I've been in full-time ministry in the church 22 years. I've started out as an 18-year-old. Uh, youth pastor, youth evangelist, youth leader and then after a couple of years we formed the youth movement called New Generation International. We did youth events, we did uh, what we call save parties, that was back in the 90s where they had rave parties. <laughs> so we traveled with a pretty massive um, rig and uh, Halls like this and bigger, we had DJs, we had bands, and you know, Worldwide Message Tribe. Anybody remember those? No, another generation. Um, we, did, we did massive, you know, Christian ministry for young people. Went to schools, went to youth groups, trying to improve the church to be able to be attractive for young people to come. And young people came in droves. Hundreds and thousands we prayed for to salvation That we met in the schools or we met on the streets. They came to church But the same week we left the church for the next church. They also left the church Okay, so we, we, we worked with that all from 1992 till 2000 the grand final of that work was that we took the biggest indoor stadium in Sweden. It's called the Globe in Sweden. I don't know what the Globe is. Yeah. The Globe has 16,000 seats. We organized it so it was a little bit more than 10,000 seats. And we said, we're going to fill that with young people praising Jesus non-stop 24 hours. We filled it. 10,700 people paid for a ticket to get in there and not 24 hours but 28 hours non-stop we had communion we had prayer night we had a um, safe party we had delirious we had christine kane we had everything you know massive event did we change sweden no did people was more people saved and discipled no the only thing we did was spend a lot of money and to make a big boom, but no big change. That's when we gave birth to this vision of United. Instead of just doing, we have tried the whole 90s to do church fresh, attractional, cool, so more people should come and think, this is really good, I want to come. They came, but when after they, came, they, they come, they went. That's probably some of the experience you also have. It's kind of, I wouldn't say it easy, but it's, there are ways that you can get people to come to church, but that's not really our mission. Our mission is not to get them to come to church. Our mission is to get them to come to Jesus, stay in Jesus, be transformed in Jesus, and start to live for Jesus. Amen? So we need to change our mind. So what we did, we went from 10,728 hour non-stop in the globe, closed our organization, shut everything down, and moved to Malmö, which is the most secular city. There had never been any real big churches, except for a little move of God in the 90s in the Pentecostal church in Malmö. 173 nationalities. The whole world basically is in Malmö. Very hard, very secular, very Danish, the Swedish is saying. <laughs> uh, we started 22 people in our living room. 
start to clarify and simplify what kind of church we want to be. And we said, we are not going to be a church we just ask people to come to. We're going to be a church that instead of saying come, is listening to Jesus saying go. We are not going to have programs. We're going to be focused on people. Because programs takes all our people and their focus to run the programs. And the more programs we have, the less time we have for people. Okay? People usually don't do programs. People do life. So we need to make room for life. So now we're going to start a new church in Malmö. We're only 22 people, best friends that have been mostly of the 90s together closely. Andreas was one of them. He came there only 15, 16 years old and um, has been with us the whole time. So how are we going to reach people? And number one, we're not going to reach people. We're not even going to try to reach them. Who want to be reached? Instead of reaching, we want to relating. Relate. Build relationships. We want to make friends. And that's what we're going to invest our time to make friends outside church. To free up time, less program in church, more focus on people outside church. Less focus on the already Christians, more focus on the not yet Christians. Amen? So we did. We started to um, get in touch with people, hang out with people, make new friends. How do you do that? You know, no organization, no outreach. This is what you do. If you have kids, easy. Every time you pick up kids every day at the daycare, there would stand 10 stressed out parents. And you have something in common. You both have kids. You both are stressed. And you both say, come on, quickly, grab your jacket. Instead of standing there watching your kids saying, hey, I'm Philip's father. Who are you? Oh, good to meet you. I'm, I'm, I'm Sarah's father. Okay. Do you usually pick up in the afternoons? Uh, you know, just say some words every day with intentions. And then after a while, you ask Sarah's father, and mother to come over when you're gonna have a barbecue. Easy, you know? People usually don't come to church, but they usually come anywhere. They, there are free food and maybe some free drinks. <laughs> that's, uh, you know, that's bullseye. And what you do? Is that an undercover service? <laughs> Is that a seeker service? You know, and when we. Standing here over the fire with our burgers. I'm thinking of fire and I'm thinking of hell. <laughs> Are you ready for heaven? <laughs> no. Another rule we came up with is saying, we're just going to love people. And we're never going to say anything about the gospel, about Jesus Christ, until they ask. We're going to be prepared. We're going to be red hot on fire in our heart. We're going to be prayed up and prepared, but we're never going to say anything unless they ask. So if they didn't ask, we didn't have any pressure. We just enjoyed our time. And we didn't befriend them to save them. We befriended them because we actually loved them. You know? So this is totally relational. We just hang out with people we actually enjoyed hanging out with. Oh, how unchristian. Huh? We didn't went to, uh, to, to people that we, you know, natural relationships that felt totally natural and actually gave energy instead of taking energy. And then, of course, the question came. Hey, Sir Magnus, why did you move to Malmö? Well, uh, there was a change of direction in the organization I worked with. Oh. What kind of organization did you work with? Well, it's pretty big. It's everywhere in every nation in the world. We have buildings, we have hospitals, we have schools, we have universities. Wow. What's the name of it? You've probably seen our logotype. It's a cross. Do you work for the Red Cross? <laughs> so actually, I work in the church. The church? Are you a priest? 
and then the discussion comes. But now the discussion lands because we have developed a relationship, trust, and so on. Okay? So, beginning of 2001, we moved to Malmö, we start this. 2002, doesn't happen much. 2003, doesn't happen much. 2004, things start to pick up because relationships is not quick fixes. This is the long-term way. Do you understand? If you want a quick fix, hire a big building, take the most awesome preacher, the coolest band, and all mostly Christians from Jutland will come and fill your seats and you will have something big and fantastic. If you want them back next Sunday, you have to have something even cooler on your platform. But if you want to reach the secular Denmark, not the Pentecostals, not the Baptists, not the Evangelicals, not the Mishfunshirken, you know, not the people that is already in church, but the people that is not yet in church, you have to relate to them. So it took us several years to grow from 22 to 30, 40, 50, and then an explosion came. Why? Because soon we had more people in church that didn't have a Christian background. That means for every new Christian that came in was a whole family, a whole network of relatives, a whole network of friends since school that knew them and knew they are not religious, they are not cultish, they are not in a sect. This is serious. We have to follow them and check this out. Do you understand? If you've been doing life with a person in your family and as a friend the last 15 years and suddenly he gets saved, you want to check out what that is. So in a very short time, with the same method, we grew to many, 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 many hundreds of people. We had to have four services on a Sunday just to keep them in church. We began to baptize every year 50, 60 70, 80, over a couple of years, we baptized many, many hundreds to Christ. Let me just break that down for you in a concept, and then we're going to open up for Q&A. Is that okay? What we do is that we pick up our model from Luke 10. So if you go in your Danish Bible to Luke 10, and we're going to read the first... Nine verses, okay? This is what Jesus do when he sends out his, his disciples. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others. That's about the average size of a free church in Denmark, okay? 72 people. He sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals or anything uh, with you. Do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace still rests on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there. Eat Drink whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, this is the kingdom of God who has come near to you. I'm going to break this down for you in how we think of building a missional church. Because we have to go from a come structure to a go structure. So I'm going to do two rows of words and then you're going to say what kind of church is our church and why. I'm not saying the one is right, the other is wrong. I'm more saying one may be more effective because we live in a post-post-modern society. Your friends are cynical. Your friends doesn't trust the church. 
your friends doesn't just come to church or walk by the church and will go into a church. Your friends and the people you do life with, their trust level, they, have, they are bombarded with information from every kind of channel. So they are very specific where they place trust. Do you understand? That's why I believe that we need to break into a more missional model of having church. So, before we were a come church, we said come to us. Now we are a go church, where we go to the people that we usually said come to. Before we had lots of meetings, now we think mission. More than meetings, we had lots of programs. Now we're thinking people. Before we, we wanted to be a mega church, now we are more of a multi church. I'm going to break them down later on. Before, we looked for seating capacity. Now we're looking for sending capacity. This made us isolated. Now we work to be incarnated. This looked very much like a religion, even if it was not old time, but new time, cool religion. This is totally based on relation. This becomes very exclusive. This is totally inclusive. I'm going to explain what I mean with it. Why? Because this put pressure on people to make a conversion, to make a decision. While here we speak about process instead of pressure. Here we have lots of consumers. Here we try to raise producers. Why do we have consumers? Because we give them entertainment. But here we equip. The entertainment needs to be spectacular. While here we're going for a simple model. The big day is Sunday. Here we focus every day. This predominantly draws saints, while this is aimed for sinners. Here we meet, here we mostly eat. This becomes a monument if we succeed. If we succeed with this, it becomes a movement. My question, are you building a monument or are you building a movement? Are you putting all your money on attractional model to attract people to come? Or are you doing a missional model that says, go? How do you know? Well, does most of your time go to plan meetings? Meetings that are cool, meetings that are seeker-oriented, meetings arrangements that should draw people, or are you more speaking about mission? In fact, not to get people to the church, but get the church to the people. If that's what you do, you're a program professional. 
you have 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 100 programs every week in your church building. It is bursting with all the different kind of drama clubs, dance clubs, youth clubs, singing choirs, you know, gatherings for seniors, gatherings for juniors. There are programs, and the programs are good. The programs are very, very good, and they need leaders, and they need venues, and they need facilities, and they need money, and they need support, and they need energy, and they need power, you know, light, and they need all that stuff. So you work a lot of with programs. So sometimes we work so much programs, we want to reach people, but we don't have time for people. So in a missional model, we don't do programs. We just make time for people. How? By not having programs. This model, usually called mega church. It's a mega building with mega much people and mega fat programs with a mega stage that do ministry mega. And some of them really succeed. I don't say, although you can hear I'm against it, I don't say it doesn't work. It does. Especially in America and Australia. Does it work in Denmark? How many examples do you have of a real mega church in Denmark? Maybe one? Culture center in Copenhagen, almost not. So what do I'm saying here? Well, I'm not against big, but this is what I'm saying. I believe small is the new big. I'm saying, is, is a church of a thousand people on a Sunday, is that big in Denmark? Okay, let's have a competition. You start a church that's going to go from zero to one thousand, one church. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to start in the same city, 10 churches of 100. Who's winning? I'm going to win. I can prophetically say that because statistics show us that it's much more easy and will give higher quality to plant 10 smaller churches in network with each other of 100 than to have one big church of 1,000. History proves us that almost no one has succeeded in Scandinavia to bring one church up in any given city over a thousand, okay? But many of you could lead a church of a hundred. Look what Jesper have done here with his team, uh, with Skywalk. You were over a hundred. Yeah. Many of you can do that if you get the support. So, if you are a mega church, you are very concerned about seating capacity. How many people does this church seat? That's what people ask us when they come and see our building. How many seats do you have in your church? They ask for seating capacity. Like we are in the fun fun funiters business, you know? I said, well, we have 420 seats. But we're not so interested in seating capacity. The really interesting ans answer question is sending capacity. I don't, I don't count how many people I have in my church. I count how many churches I have in my people. This, after a while, becomes its own little subculture, isolated. We develop our language, our style a way of interacting. And the bigger we get, we cannot be like this church in the middle of the city. We are forced to get out, isolated for ourselves. We believe in incarnation. That means we take the Word of God and let it become incarnated in the society that we are a part of. This could be religious. It means like, come, do this, do this, do this, God will bless you. This is totally relational. Exclusive, inclusive. That means this can also be inclusive. So now I'm kind of just a little bit provoking you. This can be inclusive. What I mean with inclusive is you don't have to be ready to be a part of it. 
You can belong before you believe and before you behave. In fact, we think that's the most proper way of the gospel. We think that church membership is not a diploma that is given to people that perfectly behave and believe. We think that Jesus said, come and see, come and follow, and when you're ready, come and take your cross. That means that we take away pressure and we allow process. Instead of putting pressure on people saying, do you want to be saved? Are you ready to make a decision? Yes, we do an invitation every, every time. But we want to have a process where people feel that there is a room. So almost in our church, there are more people that ask us, can I be saved? Than more times when we ask people to get saved. Do you understand the difference? When people say, you know, I cannot hold it. I think I have been saved. I think I believe. And instead of saying, yeah, come on, come on, I say, are you sure? You know, instead of lowering the ground to get as money as possible over the line, we want to under-promise and over-deliver. Instead of put pressure, allow process. So when people say, I want to be baptized, that is wonderful. But take it easy. Because... If you really has found faith and faith has found you, it will not leave you. It will mess with you and you are ruined for life. <laughs> Baby, you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> yippee ki brothers and sisters. <laughs> this creates consumers. They come and they want to consume. We're here. You need to create producers, workers. What did Jesus say? The harvest is plentiful, the workers is few. It's not that the harvest is little and the workers are many. Why are the workers few? Because they're busy consuming church. So we give them entertainment. Because if you give entertainment, you get consumers. But if you want the producers, you have to give equipment. If you start to equip people, consumers, they, they go home. Say, hey, you're way too serious. I just want to be entertained. To keep people, you have to make it more and more spectacular. Here, we make it more and more simple. Our church has gone from super cool, spectacular services that takes forever to produce to being simpler, 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 simpler. Today, we only have four services in a year that we call Super Sunday. We take them out to the biggest theater and we boom, go all in. Four Sundays in a year. The rest of the 48 Sundays, this is what we do. Nice to see you. Let's worship. We worship mostly just with the acoustic guitar and a cajon. What's it called? Cajon box. Three worship songs. Then we teach 50 minutes through the Bible, book by book. Now we're going through Ephesians. How long are you going to be in Ephesians? One year. What? Yeah. And people just come. And people just keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. It's simple. What do you do afterwards? We sit down, have a coffee, or go out for a drink, bring people home, because we believe the Word of God and the relationship, personal, mano to mano, that's the gospel. We don't do all the other spectacular things. Don't you like music? Oh, we love music. Our city is full of great concert scenes. So when we want great music, we go down there. Yeah, but what if you want to play? Why do you need to play in church? We had a few guys that said, you know, skateboard is big in Malmo. So they were, you know, uh, 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 skating board. And we have a big hall. And I said, why don't we, big, we build Malmo's biggest skateboard land? I said, why? Then all people could come here because there are so many skaters in Malmö, I said, you are so stupid, it's criminal. What do you mean? We already have the biggest skateboard land, Bryggeriet, in Malmö. Thousands of skaters every day. Idiots. Why don't you go down there instead and be missionaries and say, everything we've, of time and energy and money we were ready to spend in our church to build our own, we want to be incarnated and say, here we are. Can we help you with something? 
The same thing with music, the same thing. You know, I'm not against music, it's just we don't need to copy everything that is out there. So we say, oh, but we should have a Christian school. No, get into the schools and change them instead and be a missionary. We should have Christian daycare for babies. Yeah, or raise up missionaries with the best Christian daycare education and send them out to take care of kids. It's, you know, different concept. This is focusing on Sunday Whereas here, every day is important. We don't just live for a Sunday. We live for Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Wednesday and Thursday. That's the game day, not just Sunday. This saints usually love this church. Sinners usually is the target of this. When saints come together, they come together and meet. When sinners and we come together, we come together and eat. This it's easy to create the movement that goes from city to city, from neighborhood to neighborhood. This, if you succeed, becomes a huge monument of a great man's or a woman's faith. My question, do you want to build a monument or do you want to build a movement or why? Thank you very much for listening. Do we have 10 minutes now for Q&A? Do we have a microphone that we can send away? Questions, leadership, missional. The microphone, Michael. Um, do you want to say something about the um, balance between equipping your people but still using your time to send them out? But you still have to you know, equip them in some way. Uh, the balance between equipping and... And using your energy outside of the church. Yeah. You know what? Relationship. We equip people in two ways. Basically, we make sure that our church services that we anyway have is equipping, not just entertaining. So people, and, and we focus on guys like you. I'm, I'm thinking my wife or, you know, normal people that live a life they should be able to apply and be equipped by this teaching to be better believers, better followers, and better missionaries everyday life. Uh, the, the other thing we do is we don't have any programs. We don't have discipleship school or discipleship program. We just meet in relationships. And we ask three questions. Head, heart, hands. So if I teach today, I meet you and have a coffee tomorrow and said, okay, head, what did you hear? What's the, what was the truth you were hearing? What was the preacher saying? Heart, how that, did it challenge your life? Were you irritated? Were you provoked? Were you inspired? Was it putting light on something in your life? Tell me. Give your heart. And then hands. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to apply it? So think, feel, act. Is that answering your question? Yes. Uh, first of all, I have to say that I believe in both kind of churches, very much indeed. I believe in 200%. And um, the last two or three years, I've been discovering the other side, the Go Church, in my own life. And uh, somehow there's some difference between evangelistic Go Church and a relational Go Church. Um, I have discovered that the re relational part does work, but uh, somehow uh, uh, I have to ask you to help me to find it in the scriptures to be relational, because I find the gospels being very evangelistic, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. So help me find it in the scriptures. The be... relational part? Yeah. I'll read a gospel, any given chapter in Luke. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Jesus is relating over food, over a meal, in a party, in a home. Very relational. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree. I also find it uh, when Jesus does it, but um, he's not sending the, the disciples out to be relational. 
I'm not very critical. I just need yeah, ans yeah, yeah. answers. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's a good, good question. Um, Luke 10, when he sends the actual scripture I read, first time Jesus is sending out the disciple only to the children of Israel. It's a relational sending. Go into a home, eat, drink, heal the sick, and tell them this is the kingdom of God. Um, you can say, Paul, but, but I'm not against the evangelistic side of it, absolutely. I, I'm like you. I believe in both of the models. I lean strongly to this side. There is no such thing as a perfect model. But um, scriptural, I believe there is as good scriptural proofs for this one as there is for this one. Not uh, even if you, uh, not at least if you read Paul's teaching to the churches that already are churches, like, for example, Colossians, when you hang out with um, your unsaved or the people outside, make sure your words are salty, behave, you know, when you eat, when you lay at the table, even in, um, when you speak about um, offered meat to idols in 1 Corinthians. So I would say there's a strong relational context in the New Testament church, but not against the evangelistic. Paul came and he proclaimed the message, absolutely. Is that helping you? A few more questions. Uh, you mentioned in the first part that um, with uh, that you want to have people help you and train them uh, to ultimately to be able to do the job you're doing. What do you do in a case where you really want to train someone, but everybody is thinking in the back of their head, that job is too hard, I can't do it. So they don't come forward if you ask them. Do you mean they think uh, it's too hard as in uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dirty work or is it hard in terms of I'm not capable? Uh, in I'm not capable of doing the job. But, you know, if people want to, and you want to help them be capable, I, I don't see, um, I understand what you're saying, but if we speak, because there is one group that say, I don't want to. Well, the people that doesn't want to, don't focus on them. Um, this is, we usually say, if you have to, don't bother. But if you want to, here's an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, the the, yeah, the thing I had in mind was with, uh, with sound and lights and everything. People look at it, they see a million buttons and they think, there's no way I can learn anything about that. So even though if we go out and ask people, they might say, oh, it's, it, it looks great, but there's no way I can do it. They don't have uh, any confidence that they can learn. So I don't know if you've got a solution to that or... I understand what you mean. Um, young, there is something with age to that. You know, my, my son, he's soon nine. His biggest dream, he can stay for three, four services on a Sunday in different churches if he can stand with you back there. That is his, you know, he come home and we hardly can get him to bed. Start to train people in the age of eight, in the age of nine, in the age of ten. Make them the heroes. They're going to feel like the most important person in the world if they be able to sit with you, have headphones, you know, watch things, help them, you know, lights and so on. Use young guys. I, that's my experience. Yeah. Thanks for the advice. And can I say one more thing? Use girls. The best sound I've ever heard, no offense, brother, is when a girl is in charge of the sound. I agree. Paul Scanlon, how many have heard Paul Scanlon? He's been in Denmark. This is what he told me that made sense for me. He said, I've been to every West End theater in London and I never once experienced bad sound. So one day, he said, I went to one of the theater manager in the West End London and said, I've been, you know, seeing hundreds of theater, you know, musicals. I never once experienced with so many microphones and so many people and they're running out and backstage, on stage. 
I never seen somebody late or somebody, you know, having bad sound. What's the secret? And the manager says, never ever have a man behind the board. I said, what do you mean? We have only girls. Why? Because girls don't have to prove themselves. When a girl has found something, this is how, how we do, they do it. They get the instructions and then they do it because they're secure. A man says, ah, where is it? <laughs> they start to change it because they want to be somebody. They want to be awesome. Girls and young guys. I was, yes, there. One more question? One more question? Yep. Guy over there has the last question. You better be good now, brother. Don't feel any pressure. Traveling in Denmark for some years, what would you say is the um, biggest threats in the Danish culture to us as becoming young leaders, like Christians, to become young leaders? Okay, no offense, you ask me. This, I say to serve you, we work, we have churches now in many different nations. We do almost exactly the same. We, we say that we have a global vision and model, but the local flavor. So we adopt it into different flavors. What I can see is a big difference in Copenhagen, which makes it take longer time in Copenhagen than anywhere else or in Denmark, is that there seems to be a strong degree on being cynical in Denmark. To have the right to my own very personal, unique opinion and always speak about it. I also see that there are few really large companies in Denmark Everyone is a solo player. Um, I don't know if that's right, but that's how I, it seems to be that as soon as you come together in corporate, it takes a long time because you are anti-strong leadership and you're very consensus-driven. Who do you think you are that's going to tell us what to do? Sit down and we're going to discuss until we have a consensus. When we have consensus, we have a very little buy-in because nobody really fully believes in it. So we start to speak pretty harsh about it. And we laugh and we ironically and cynically make jokes about it. This is the worst version of it. That is one thing I'm afraid of when I come to Denmark. I see so many signs that that is not the truth. I see so many good signs, so many young leaders, so many older leaders that are flexible and open and are ready to do whatever. So I don't believe that's the whole truth. But I believe, and maybe you can spell it out much more clearer because you live in it if you not are blinded by it. But that's what I can see in our team, in church teams that I come from. Everyone saying, I just want to tell you my opinion. And say, you know what? That's not important. If we're going to go through all the 300 people here and everybody's going to tell their opinion, what do we win? No, but that's my right to tell my opinion. He's like, no, it's not. <laughs> and then instead, you go into a cynical, uh, unbelief setting where you make harsh yoke and say, yeah, Magnus Persson, he's going to save the world. <laughs> but when he comes to Denmark, he will find out it's not that easy. Let's break that, friends. Let's stand up as leaders to speak well of our nation, to don't let that color um, the way we see Denmark, but to see Denmark through the eyes of Jesus and understand that out of nothing, God can create everything. What is a nobody on the spiritual map can actually be a somebody in the kingdom of God. Of the least, God can make a thousand. Amen. I believe in you, Denmark. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you for being so kind and warm and open. You have been zero cynical and, you know, that wrong thing. And I have hope for Denmark. I pray for you. I pray that you will create a movement. Thank you.